Uh, something the Holy Ghost uh, has put on my heart to, to share with you is a message of the seven churches. How many know we're living in the time of the end, the end of the end? Jesus is coming back. We're living in that time frame right now. And you need to be ready. You need to know because Jesus is coming. He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkles. You know what that means? There's going to be a lot of correction going on. A lot of correction going on to get right as he's coming back. Amen. So the message the Lord has given me for you is the message to the seven churches from the book of Revelation. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, this is the only book that promises you a blessing when you read it and when you hear it. But we're going to start this off. It says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. How many know the Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ? And the book of Revelation is the culmination of that revelation, the unveiling of who he is. To know him, to see him, you find him in every book of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, he's all through the word of God. It's a revelation of him. The unveiling of the divine mysteries. God gave it to him, so God gave it all to Jesus, and look what it says, to disclose and to make known to his bondservants, that's his love slave. That word there, bondservants, is a, a Greek word, doulos. That means you're just a love slave of Jesus Christ. You just love him with everything. You're just, you just totally committed to him. He said, certain things which must shortly and speedily come to pass in their entirety. And he sent and communicated it through his angel messenger to his bondservant, John who testified to and vouched for all that he saw. Actually, the King James says he signified it or signified it. In other words, God, the language of the Holy Ghost is dreams and visions. He gives dreams and he gives visions. Um, to be honest with you, I've had so many dreams and, and visions, uh, especially dreams, uh, you know, I can't count over the years. And I thank God for all those privileges of, of having those revelations from God. Some have been corrective, some have been prophetic, some have, he, he spoke to me about things I needed to do. So the language of the Holy Ghost is dreams and visions. That's normal Christianity to have dreams and visions. In a lot of places, you know, you say you have a dream or a vision. They say, man, where are you from? Well, from heaven. Glory to God. I've been born again. You know, born again means from above. You know that? That's what born again means. So when I got born again, His Spirit came to live in me. Glory to God. The Bible says, old man will dream dreams, and young man will have visions. Now, verse, let's look at verse 3. Now look at this. This is the blessing. You ought to claim this. I get so excited. Glory to God because I am going to read this aloud to you and the Bible says I am blessed. You hear it. You are blessed for hearing this. This is the only book that promises this. Revelations 1 and 3. Blessed, happy to be envied is the man who reads aloud in the assemblies the word of this prophecy. And blessed, happy to be envied are those who hear it read and who keep themselves true to the things which are written in it, heeding them and laying them to heart for the time... Uh, for them to be fulfilled is near. So this book promises you a, a blessing. A lot of preachers run away from the book of Revelation because they don't understand it and they don't, they don't fully uh, grasp uh, its meaning. But here we are at the end of the end time and it's time for us to understand some things here. Now John, this is Revelation 1-4, John to the seven assemblies, the churches that are in Asia. Now that's not Asia as we think of China. That's actually the Turkey area. May grace, that's God's unmerited favor, be granted to you and spiritual peace, that's the peace of God's kingdom. How many know peace comes from Jesus? When you have Jesus as Lord of your life, there's a peace in your heart. He's the Prince of Peace. You may not have everything right in your life going on around you, but when you've got Him in your heart, you can have the peace of God in any situation. The word peace also means nothing missing, nothing broken. And I'm believing God for everyone to be healed, everyone to be completely delivered. Nothing missing, nothing broken. So it's the peace of Christ's kingdom from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits or the sevenfold Holy Spirit before his throne. Now, if you look up on your screen there, you'll see the, the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Tyra, Terra, Pergamo, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. All in the same area, okay? You can see that on the map. I know you can't see that by live stream right now. <clears throat> but I want to show you that he mentions the sevenfold Holy Spirit. <coughs> Now, there's one Holy Spirit, but seven manifestations of His Spirit. Isaiah 11.2 talks about this. It says this. This is the actual scripture. The Spirit of the Lord, that's one, shall rest upon Him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. How many know there's a Spirit of wisdom in the Holy Ghost and understanding? When I got born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, the Bible became alive to me. I got understanding I never had before. And what you see on the screen is a, a lamp or it's a menorah. It's got seven candlesticks there, right? Seven candlesticks. And in the holy place in the tabernacle, 
If you walked into the holy place, there was no natural light. You had to walk by the light of those candlesticks. And how many know to walk with God, you're going to have to walk by supernatural light. You're going to have to have the Holy Ghost to teach you the things of His Spirit to walk with God. <clears throat> Could you do me a favor, my brother? Give me some water real quick. Nobody likes a dry preacher, right? Amen. <laughs> oh, glory. Hallelujah. So the Spirit of the Lord is one, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of counsel. <clears throat> He's the wonderful counselor. God will give you counsel. Many times I go to God and I say, God, I need to talk to you. I need some counsel. And the Spirit of the Lord begins to speak to me about my situation. If you'll get quiet in God's presence, He will counsel you. He'll talk to you about anything in life, amen, if you just wait upon Him. <clears throat> He's the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, this is Revelations 1 and 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful and trustworthy witness, and the firstborn of the dead. So Jesus was the first to be brought back to life. Many people were resurrected from the dead in the Gospels, but Jesus was the first to come back from the dead, never to die again. Glory to God. And the prince, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who ever loves us and has once and for all loosed and freed us from our sins by his own blood. Now, I love that, to him who ever loves us. You know, he loves you at your worst. He sees you at your worst, and he still loves you. Sometimes we're so performance-based. Well, God, you know, God doesn't love me. or No, God loves you. He sees you at your worst. That's what love is. Love sees the very worst, embraces the worst in you. But here's the good news. He's not going to leave you there, amen? He's not going to leave you in that place because he loves you so much. <clears throat> he loosed us and freed us from our sins by his own blood. Now, verse 6 says, and formed us into a kingdom, a royal race, a priest to his God. I don't know if you know this, but you're a priest of the Most High God, a royal race, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. The Bible says a peculiar people, glory to God, a peculiar people. Unto God and his Father, to him be the glory and power and majesty and dominion throughout all ages forever and ever. Now, this is what God has always desired for us, his people, the priesthood. For everyone to, to be priests unto him. Now, in the Old Testament, I want to show you this really quick. This is Exodus 19.3. Before I get into this church, I just want to go through this first chapter. Amen? To, to, to give you some foundation here. Exodus 19.3 says this. Moses went up to God. How many know any move to God, you're moving up? Remember the Jeffersons? Moving on up. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're moving closer to God, you're moving up. You come into church, you're worshiping God, you're moving up. You're in the word of God, you're moving up. The Bible says people that go up to Jerusalem, you go up because you have to go up a mountain. So whenever you're getting closer to God, you're moving on up. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He elevates you, amen, in life and everything that you do when you move closer to him. And the Lord God called to him out of the mountain and said this to the house of Jacob. Tell the Israelites, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I love this. Eagle's wing speaks of power that rises higher above storms and the difficulties of life. God bore his people on eagle's wings to himself, and God does the same for us. He, he brings you to himself. Doesn't matter what you're going through, he'll raise you up on eagle's wings. You'll rise higher than the storms of life. He's bringing you to himself, glory to God, in relationship. It's what he did for Israel, and he'll do it for you. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice, now this is a master key. Obedience, tell your neighbor, obedience is a master key to the blessings of God. If you just but obey, if you just but obey, obey God, obedience to God is a master key to everything that God wants to do in your life. There are many things God wants to do, but we disobey and we, do, we keep doing the wrong things and many times it, 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 it causes delays in our life for the things we're believing for or sometimes not at all if we stay in disobedience. We've got to obey the Lord and walk in obedience to His commands. Obedience tells God, I love you. Now listen, we had a worship time, and it was a great worship time. We had raised hands, and that's wonderful. We're worshiping. I sing praises to your name, O Lord. And we sing that, and I love that. That's awesome, and God inhabits the praises of his people. But if you disobey God, you're telling God you don't love him. You know that? Scripture says, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, obey me. When you obey the Lord, you're telling God that you love him. I often tell the story, if I tell my kids, take the garbage out. He says, Dad, I love you. Dad, you're the best dad. It could be Father's Day, and you give me a cup, a mug, a jacket, whatever it may be. You're the best dad in the whole world. And I say, son, take the garbage out. And he doesn't do it. He's telling me, look, I don't really love you because I'm not going to listen to your word. 
See, when you love, when you love someone, you're going to obey their word. And when you love the Lord, you're going to obey his word and walk in obedience. Now, Israel didn't do it. Israel didn't do it. He says, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice in truth and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own particular, a peculiar possession and treasure from among and above all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, consecrated. You know what consecrated means? Set apart. I had a friend growing up, and his, his uh, mama bought a bunch of new furniture, and it was consecrated. You couldn't go in there. You couldn't sit on it. They put like a little rope, and it was... You know, and I'm thinking, well, you bought all this furniture, nobody can enjoy it. Yeah, my mama didn't believe that. My, my, my daddy was a prophet and didn't know it. Because, see, we'd sit at the table. We had a nice table. And we used that table. Mama said, mama used to say, we're going to use the table. We're not going to put it in a showroom. And my dad said, the way you're sitting on it, boy, all I'm going to have is junk one day. And what a prophet he was, because that thing looked like junk after years. Glory to God. <laughs> But we used the blessing. It wasn't on the showroom floor. Consecration means you're set apart. You've been consecrated to God. And when you're consecrated, there's certain things you're not going to do, certain things you're not going to touch, certain places you're not going to go when you say, I'm consecrated to God. Amen? A lot of people have forgotten about that. Consecrated, set apart. Look at this. For the worship of God. <clears throat> These are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. So this is what God's desire. Now, it's really interesting, when Moses was up on the mount hearing from God, the people began to play down at the base of the mountain, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And when Moses suddenly came back, the people were worshiping a golden calf, that God they made in their own image, and that's happening today. It's a prophetic picture. When Jesus is coming back to the earth, he said, well, I find faith when I come. Many people are worshiping a God they made in their own image, their own mindset. Oh, well, God's not going to judge us. God's not going to do that. No, God is a God of the Word. God is a God of the Bible. And if you want to know God, you've got to study the Word of God to know God. And he's going to come back just like Moses came back. And he found the people had rose up to play. And then this is something interesting he said. He said, who's on the Lord's side? And the Levites came to Moses. And this is the question, who's on the Lord's side? Because I see in our nation today, who's on the Lord's side? They call it liberal. They call it conservative. But I like to say right and wrong, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who's on the Lord's side? Who's, on the, who's with God, amen? You see that in our nation right down the middle. Now, verse 7 says this. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Now, look at that. Somebody put bright adorn up there on a whole horse. That might be me. Praise God. <laughs> We're going to come back with him, the Bible says. Glory to God. That's exciting. And every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. If you go read the book of Joel, this is really interesting about the coming of the Lord. The Bible says they shall run through a troop, leap over a wall. You'll run them through with a sword and they won't die. Why? You'll have a resurrected body when you're coming back at the battle of Armageddon. That's what the Bible teaches us in the book of Joel. Oh, praise God, you can't die anymore at that time. It says, every eye will see him, and those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth shall gaze upon him and beat their breasts. So if somebody says, the Lord has come back and he's in the desert, don't believe it. Or somebody comes up and says, they're the Messiah, don't believe it. Because Jesus said, I'm going to split the eastern sky when I come back, and every eye is going to see the Lord coming in the clouds of glory. He's coming back. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, a lot of people will say, you know, you know I want to I get one of those shirts that says, there is a God and you're not him. Glory to God. A lot of false messiahs out there. Mm -mm. Don't ever put your hopes in man. Put your hopes in God. He says, and they shall beat their breasts and mourn and lament over him. And, and even so must it be. Amen and so be it. For I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, the ruler of all. Glory to God. And he's your daddy. Praise God. Now this is Revelation 1.9 now. I, John, your brother and companion, your share and participation with you in the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance which are in Jesus Christ. How many know if you preach the gospel, there'll be tribulation? Some people aren't going to like you for decreeing what, what God has said over your life or speaking the word of God to them. The persecution will come for the word's sake. Persecution. When you preach the word of God, persecution will come. In America, we're so blessed. You can go to, your, to read your Bible uh, in your house and, and wherever you want to go, in the park, freedom, whatever you want to do. You, we're free here, but in many nations, they're being persecuted. I just read about an Indian nation where they took a man and a woman and they accused them of desecrating the Koran in militant Islam. And what they did, they burned them in a kiln. They killed them alive. In Syria, Christians are being persecuted. We are so blessed in America. We have the freedom to pray, the freedom to seek God. But how many use that freedom? 
How many use that freedom to really seek God? Or does your, does your Bible cry out with dust on it? Read me every day. You can spend time with God. You're free to serve the Lord. This nation has been blessed by God. So patient endurance, which are in Jesus Christ. I was on the isle called Patmos, banished on account of my witnessing to the word of God. Now, history tells us that John the apostle, they tried to kill him. They put him in some boiling oil to boil him alive. But I guess he was hotter than the oil because he didn't die. So they banished him onto an isle called Patmos, a little isle in the Aegean Sea. He said, on account of my witnessing to the word of God and the testimony, the proof, the evidence of Jesus Christ so he said I'm not shutting up amen how many preachers have shut up today they're not preaching the word anymore they're afraid of the homosexual agenda and won't preach the word of God I'm gonna decree the word of God amen I'm not gonna water it down I'm not gonna compromise it we're gonna keep preaching Jesus Christ till he comes back again we're not gonna water it down and in some places they don't want to offend anybody no prophecy in church nobody talk in tongues nobody move in the supernatural well, if you want that go to a graveyard there's lots of quiet things going on there God is supernatural. And when he shows up on the scene, mighty things will take place. The power of God will move in the midst of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. How many know God comes to church? Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. I like to say what we call revival is just normal with God. It's just, that's normal. Some of y'all are going to be a shock when you get to heaven. You see what's going on there. Wow. So I was in the spirit, wrapped in his power on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me the great voice, the calling of a war trumpet. The voice of God is like a war trumpet. The Bible says to lift up your voice like a trumpet. Amen? So here's this voice behind him like a war trumpet. And he's having a vision. He says, then I turned to see whose who was the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a robe which reached down to his feet with a girdle of gold about his breast. And his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes flashed with a flame of fire. His feet glowed like burnished bright bronze as if it was refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. Now this is John who laid his head upon Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, having this vision. We're going to see how he reacted to this. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And from his mouth there came forth a short, sharp two-edged sword, which is, we know is, which is the word of God. And his face was like the sun shining in full power at midday. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if dead. People that had experiences with God, they say, well, you know, well, I just saw Jesus, had an experience with God. Man, I'm going to tell you what, I've been in his glory, and I understand what this scripture is saying. I told God one time, I said, God, you're killing me as his glory was just, his power was surging through me. There's a fear of God in his presence. I remember sometimes just being in his presence, not, need, not even knowing what to say, like, oh, just, just overwhelmed with his glory. So he fell at his feet as dead. Now look at this, but he laid his right hand upon me. That's the hand of favor. The right hand speaks of favor. He put his right hand on him. You've been favored by God. The Bible says he sits on the right hand of God, and we're in the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. And he said, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. The ever-living one. I am living in the eternity of eternities. I died, but see, I'm alive forevermore and possess the keys of death and Hades, the realm of the dead. This is our Lord. Now, he said, write therefore the things you see, what they are, and signify, and what it is to take place hereafter. As to the hidden meaning of the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand and the seven lampstands of gold, the seven stars are the seven angels, the messengers of the seven assemblies, the churches. Well, I guess you could say that's the pastor. So that encourages me. I'm in his right hand. Glory to God. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches in his hand. So here he is with this vision of seven churches. Why is he going to pick seven particular churches? God always does everything for a reason. Nothing's there by happenstance. There was a church at Jerusalem. There was about 100 churches at this time. But he chose seven, seven particular churches. Now, these churches, some of them thought they were doing great and they really weren't. And some of them thought they were doing bad and they really were doing good. How many know God sees things different? See, today we judge by numbers. There's a, there's a church that started a couple years ago in New York. It's got about 6,000 people and they, they meet in a nightclub and they don't say anything offensive and I mean, you know, they, just, they just preach a watered down gospel basically. You know, if, if numbers were an indicative of the call of God, then Noah's an absolute failure because only eight people got saved and that was his family. 
Well, no, you're a failure, no, because you only got eight people. They were just your family. That's the only ones you got saved. And the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. We, don't, we can't judge the call of God by our pocketbook. If you're going to find out in these churches, some think because they've got a lot of money that they're pleasing to God. Well, there's a lot of people with a lot of money that aren't pleasing to God. You can't judge the call of God by your pocketbook. Oh, well, God thinks I'm, I'm, I'm really doing well because you've got a lot of money. You could have no money at all, just a lot of faith and please God. God doesn't judge by those things. He looks at the heart. What's your attitude? What's your heart attitude towards Him? We can't judge by all the outward things. God sees things entirely different. Doesn't judge by money. Can't judge your call. Even, if, well, I prophesy, you can't judge by that. Or I, I do this. Or I, listen, it's a heart to God of obedience. Amen, that God's looking for. And these seven churches are going to give us a message. Now, the four applications of these, or levels of meaning, why Jesus chose these seven churches. Now, the first one, each literal church of that day, Sir William Ramsey excavated these churches. They were literal churches that he was speaking to in that day. Now, elements of these churches exist in every church today. That's the next reason why he chose these seven churches, because you'll find this in every church today as, as we go through this. Here's the third thing. There's a personal application to every believer in these churches. You'll find out. You can apply it to your life. You know, I like to say, if the shoe fits, you're Cinderella. Amen? If the shoe fits, you're Cinderella. Listen, God, God gives you his word, and we, we have a response. There's a message I'm going to preach later on called Encountering God. And in, in encounters with God, people have responded differently, like Cain in the Bible. God said, Cain's sin is at the door. And what did Cain do? What did Cain do? He responded with rebellion instead of repentance. Some God came to and responded with rebellion and not repentance. How you respond to God will determine many things. You see, Cain didn't respond right. So there's a personal application to how we, re how we respond to the things of God. When God corrects us, respond to it. The highest form of wisdom is to embrace the correction of God against your sinful nature. Highest form of wisdom. Number four, here, there's a history of the church prophetically in these churches. Pretty amazing, as you see there up on your screen. You see uh, Ephesus is the first one. And that's the apostolic age, the original church, the apostolic, where they went out as a missionary church that was reaching the world. That's about 96 AD. The second church was Smyrna, we're going to talk about. Jesus told them they would have persecution. Smyrna seemed like they were insignificant, but Jesus didn't have anything negative to say about them. He said, you'll suffer tribulation 10 days. There were 10 Roman emperors that persecuted that church. They were fed to lions. They, they were made lampstands and lights for Nero literally covered with tar and burnt as burning torches. I mean, they went through great, great persecution for the name of the Lord. But you know, the amazing thing about it is the church grew in persecution. You know, in China, the Chinese Christians, I heard they were praying for us. Wait a minute, we've been praying for you guys. You're under such persecution. They said, no, we're praying, we're praying for you because there's so much compromise in the American church. That's what they said. Yeah, you know, remember I said spot and wrinkle? Well, how do you get spots and wrinkles out? A little heat. That's a great job of getting spots and wrinkles out. It's called ironing, right? Pergamos. So Satan couldn't destroy the church in Smyrna, and we'll talk about that later on. Pergamos means mixed marriage. When Constantine made the church the legal religion, and they mixed Babylonianism in with the church and watered it down. That's what Pergamos means, mixed marriage. We'll get into that. Tyra Terra. We'll go into that. Uh, it talks about, this is where the church at Jezebel was in control. Sardis, the church that had a name that was alive but was dead, had nothing going on. It was like a graveyard. Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, and Laodicea, when we talk about that, it means the power of the laity or the power of the people or the pews rule. In other words, God's not dictating what's going on anymore. It's what's pleasing to the people. And today I find that there's a people that are looking for preachers. They have itching ears. Tell me something good. Don't tell me anything about sin. Don't talk about my sin. Don't mention my sin. Don't talk about repentance. Don't talk about these things. Just tell me something good. Oh my goodness. That's where we're at today. And we're going to talk about Laodicea. God is a good God, but we've got to walk in obedience to Him. Now the first church we're going to talk about is Ephesus, is Ephesus. This is the first church mention of the seven. Now he says this, Revelations 2 and 1. To the angel, the messenger of the assemblies, the church in Ephesus, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars, which, which are the messengers of the seven churches, in his right hand. Now as a pastor, I tremble before you. Because what a great responsibility I have to be faithful to the word of God, to preach the word of God, to teach the word of God. And I tremble before you and I tremble before God at this responsibility. 
Because listen, that's, that's a hefty responsibility. The Bible says that as those who teach the word of God will receive stricter judgment. That's what the Bible says. I told God that. He said, yes, son, but I also gave you greater grace. So I got that. Thank you, God. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Glory to God. When I answer God, I say, yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> so in his right hand, he goes about among the seven golden lampstands, which are the seven churches. Now, literally, he's saying, I'm walking in the seven churches. I've, Jesus has been in the church before. He sat on the stage right over here. There's other times he walked across the front in here. There's times I knew it and times I didn't know it. I just remember one time in particular, we were having a praise and worship service, and I, I gave the word. That's why I remember this. The Lord said he was standing right in front of somebody, looking into their eyes, and they did not discern his presence. And he was grieved by that. They were so insensitive to God. He said, I'm looking into your eyes, and you don't even know I'm here. They were insensitive. I never, I never forgot that. When he sat on the stage right here, I had my shoes off. I was like, wow. Wow, yeah. Some of you weren't here. Some of you were here in that service. And you know how I always end in a blessing? I, I never forget this, too. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I just, you know, you're sitting on the stage and watching everybody as they were giving their offering, and you're walking up, and I'm looking at this, and I gave a prophetic word. I don't remember how long it was. It was a, a, a while. I remember... Uh, Associate Pastor Hall at the front door told me I had repeated things that people said in conversations. I guess when you're repeating Jesus, amen, you can't miss on that, right? And uh, when I gave the blessing, he raised his right hand afterwards. He said, now I give my blessing. So I repeated his blessing. He sat right there. Wow. So he does walk in the midst of the church, amen? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Don't you believe that? Wait a minute, Pastor Joe, that's out there. Jesus came to church? Yeah. Who are we worshiping? The Lord of glory, amen? Expect him to come. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Here's the history of Ephesus. I want to give you a little background real quick so you can understand Ephesus. Ephesus was founded in 1400 B.C. It was an early temple to the mother goddess, an ancient Hittite fertility deity who later became uh, in, uh, identified with Diana. It eventually became a Roman capital in Asia. It was called the Queen of Asia. Asia. It had a prominent harbor which attributed to its great wealth. So they had a lot of money coming into this city. It has its own municipal government and its own senate. Now, Ephesus was extremely wealthy, okay, because of its unusual port. And there's a picture up on the screen of the port. It was bringing a lot of money into the city. All trade from Greece and Italy ran through it. It had a theater. Now, you check out this theater. The theater was 490 feet in diameter and held 25,000 people. That's a huge theater for the day. 25,000 people could go into this theater at Ephesus. Really big place. Now, the theater had and exhibited fights of wild beasts and men with beasts. That was the, the entertainment. They had a marble way that was lined with statues and fountain from the temple Artemis through the city that ran to the Magnesia Gate. So they had all these uh, uh, nice, you know, not nice, but they had a lot. Of, I guess it was nice, but it was a false gods and stuff, those statues and things. They had another way called the uh, Arcadian Way that ran all the way out to the port. It was about 1,800 feet long and 70 feet wide. They also had a library there that boasted 200,000 books. Now, that's a, that's a lot of books when you don't have a printing press, right? It's kind of interesting. From the library, they had, a, they had a, a tunnel, a secret tunnel that went to the brothels. So if you lost your husband in a library, you might have been in trouble, right? You'd send him. Literally, that's, that's the city was a, a, a sinful city, okay? Now, the other thing it had was a temple to Diana, this false god. The most outstanding feature of Ephesus was the temple of Diana, who was thought to be the daughter of Zeus. Zeus is none other than Satan. And when we get into the other churches, I'm going to show you that Zeus is none other than the devil. And the sister of Apollo, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was four times as large as the Parthenon of Athens. And it was characterized by immorality in female and male prostitutes. Ephesus also had a first bank. It was a center for arts and magic. When you read the book of Acts, you're going to find out that they burned. When they came to Christ, they burned their implements of magic. They got rid of it when the knowledge of God came in. Now, you can also remember that Demetrius, in the book of Acts, was a silversmith of Ephesus, and he persecuted Paul for preaching the gospel. When Paul preached the gospel in Ephesus, they, he had a lot of persecution. I'm going to show you why. Acts 19.23, at the same time, there was no small stir about that way. Now, Christianity is called the way. The way means course of life, mode of action. So when they preached, Christianity was called the way. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There was no small stir. Are you stirring up trouble because you're preaching the gospel? Listen, when you preach the gospel, it's going to create a division. Jesus said, we're coming into the Christmas season, and, you know, we see these, we see these uh, Christmas cards. It says, peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then you read in the gospel, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. What? Put that on your Christmas card. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. 
for a man will be at variance with his wife and his wife with the mom, you know, and so forth. Because when you preach the gospel, you've got to make a decision who Christ is. And those who reject Christ are going to go from you. Those who receive Christ will come to you. When I got saved, I created a stir in my family, in my relatives. I preaching the gospel and carrying the cross on the streets and saying, Jesus is Lord. He's coming back again. He's going to catch us up in the clouds. Are you excited? They're like, you crazy, man. You crazy, dude. Yeah, you really want to get them offended. Say, and I give, I give 10% now to the Lord. I'm so excited. you brainwashed, man. you just brainwashed. I said, man, my brain needed a washing. Do you know the junk that was up in here? My God. Washed in the word of God. That's the only washing. Glory to God. Yeah, when people tell you out of your mind, say, you are exactly right. I'm into the mind of Christ. I got rid of my mind and got born again. Praise God. Yeah, but there's a stir when you start preaching the gospel. It stirs things up. Stirs things up. And that's what happened to Paul. And a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, how many know when God wants to bless you, he's going to send somebody. And when the devil wants to persecute you, he's going to send somebody. There'll be somebody. There'll be a face behind it. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's, we get so angry with flesh and blood, but it's really a demon behind it, yeah. behind that person. And the devil will send somebody to cause you trouble. That's what happened to Paul. Most people think Paul's thorn in the flesh was an eye problem, but I, I don't believe that was it. Paul told us what it was. He said it was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. Everywhere he went, he had persecutions and stonings and all kind of trouble. Why? Because Satan was after him. Right. Now remember this. Just kind of a side note, this is an hors d'oeuvre. Paul had great revelations. Paul had great revelations. Remember this. If God gives you great revelations, get ready, get ready, get ready. It's not like TDJs. Get ready, get ready, get ready. For what? Persecution. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had dreams. I've had visions. I've heard God's voice audible twice. But you know what? All hell was breaking loose in my life. And God was there to steady my faith. When you have great revelations... Great testimonies. Listen, it's not there just to make you tingle and feel good. You're about to go through something. Just, just what I'm telling you what my experience has been. When I talk about experience, I tell you about experience. Yeah, oh, glory to God, I'm woken up by an angel and all hell broke loose. <laughs> trouble, trouble. Then a song, you have a commercial with the little dog and the bones floating around. Trouble, 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 trouble. Oh, my goodness. When I got saved, nobody was excited. They thought I was nuts. Everybody exited my life. Yeah, exited my life, left, said, you're crazy, man. Yeah, I've been through it. But God strengthened me, and God gave me dreams, and God gave me visions, and my faith was steady. It steadied my faith, and that's what God will do. So you don't have to worry about what you're going to go through in life. You don't have to worry about the end times. Listen, you say, what's going to happen in these end times? There'll be greater glory. There'll be greater grace. There'll be more signs, wonders, and visions, and deliverances from God. God's not going to leave you. God's not going to leave you out to dry. There's nothing you're going to go through that God's not going to go through with you. He's a faithful God. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Two, two Muslim kids, I heard this story. Two Muslim kids were locked in a tomb because their father put them in a tomb to kill them. A month went by. They went to check on them and they were alive. I said, how did you survive? They said, a man in white kept coming and feeding us. <laughs> Do you know in the Muslim world, Jesus is appearing to many of them and they're giving their life to Christ? Yeah, they're giving their life to Christ. They're praying to a false god. And I did say Muslim, it's a false god. I put that on the live stream. They're praying to a false god, but they have a dedication to a false god. They're willing to die for that false god. But how much more as Christians should we be dedicated to the true and living God? Dedicated to the study of his word. Dedicated to prayer. They're praying three times a day. They stop everything to pray. Listen, how many, how many times do you pray a day? Do I pray a day? We need to be more dedicated to the true and living God. Sold out. Are you sold out? Are you sold out? I read in the Bible there's a king, one of the worst kings of Israel named Ahab. And the Bible says he was sold out to evil. Well, I determined in my heart I'm going to be sold out to good, sold out to Jesus Christ. I want him to have every part of my heart, every part of my soul, every part of my being, every part of my body. You know what? If I got one left, one praise left in me, you know, if I got healthy hands or something's wrong with my body, I want to be able to lift something up to praise him. I'm going to praise him. I made up my mind. I'm going to worship him. Come hell and high water, I'm going to worship him. And you got to get that in your spirit. I thank God I've got a healthy body. Matter of fact, I believe in God for healing and health all the days of my life. Why? Because I want to preach the gospel. I want to be healthy all the days of my life for one reason, to preach the gospel. I want prosperity for one reason, to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reach more people. How many remember the movie Schindler's List? Schindler's List? I'll never forget one part in that movie. 
he took off his ring and he said, oh, I could have sold this and saved more people. See, some of us are holding on to stuff in this world and we think it's so precious, but when we get to heaven, we're going to look back and you're going to say, I could have did more for missions. I could have sent more to missions. I, I could have did more. I could have did more. Well, I want to live without regrets and preach this gospel across this nation and to this world. Amen? Glory to God. I don't want to have any regrets when I'm going to look back. I want to tell God, God, I gave you 100%. There's 30, there's 60, there's 100-fold believers, and I want to be a 100-fold believer. How about it? You join me to be a 100-fold believer. Amen? You know, it's not, about, it's not about church growth. It's about saving souls and filling the house of God with people that need Jesus that we can disciple and teach and train and then send them out to a lost and dying world. My God, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So here's Paul again. They were making, it says at the same time there rose no small stir about the way and a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. So they were making bank, okay? As they say in the, the normal vernacular, buku money, right? When he called together with the workmen of the like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath pers uh, persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. Now, that's, that's crazy. If you think about it, you, you make a God that you bow down and worship. And now, we don't do that anymore. What we do now is we do other things and put other things first in our life. We just put other things first. There's people here today that should be here, but they're not here because they don't want to miss the game. It's called Sabiticus Morbidicus. It hits men mainly. It doesn't really affect as many women. What happens, Sabiticus Morbidicus happens early Sunday morning when you wake up and you know the game's on at 12 and you go, oh, I'm feeling good, man. I, I just, you know, I worked all week. My back is, is hurting. I don't think I can make church. You know, I think I need, baby, I think I need to stay home. It's a case of Sabiticus Morbidicus. Oh, but you know the amazing thing is God is so good at 12 o'clock, you're healed. Ah, glory! Ah, did you see that? At kickoff, you're healed. Your arm that was hurting works good as you shove chips in your mouth. Oh, yeah! Healed the Sabiticus Morbidicus that happens to men usually on Sundays. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You quote three scriptures, but you can quote all the stats because you spend all your time on fantasy football. No time with God. Now, y'all know I'm telling the truth. My goodness. Oh, boy, boy, boy. Okay, let's see where I was at here. So not only this craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, like he really cared about that, right? And her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So this whole mob is just crying out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. What he really cared about was his pocketbook. And you're going to find there's a lot of people that don't get saved because of money. Yeah, there's some people, I, I've known of a couple, that they've been living together for 20 years, and she got some money from her husband's pension or something, and if she gets married, she loses it, so she's living in sin, so she won't lose the money. Where's your trust in God? Where's obedience to God's commands? Because of money. Many people won't make heaven because of money. That's a fact. That's a fact. They're putting money first. Stuff and things first. Jesus is further. You follow Jesus, money will follow you. I've known how to abase and I know how to abound. Yeah, I've been, it seemed like I've been broke as a day as long, but still praising God. And I know how to abound when the money's come in. Praise God and just be blessed. But Jesus is my source in it all. And my praise, I'll keep my praise, amen. The devil ain't getting my praise, amen. Don't let him get your praise. Don't let him get your worship. Now, Revelations 2 and 2 begins with this. This is what Jesus says about him. He has some good things to say, which, by the way, I want you to notice a pattern here. In correction, he tells them what they're doing right. Many times we correct our kids. We don't tell them what they're doing right. Oh, yeah. We're just negative. Harp, harp, harp. The Bible talks about fathers. He says, fathers, you know, don't, don't harass your kids. Don't constantly keep putting them down. You've got to give encouragement. What are you doing right? How often we see people and we're just so critical. We don't look at what they're doing right. Look at what they're doing right. Say, man, you're doing this great. You're doing that great. You're doing this great. Ah, you got some areas over here you, you need to work on, but let me tell you how you can get that better in your life. That's positive correction. But when we're critical, all we do is point out all the flaws, flaw after flaw after flaw. And you keep pushing on flaws long enough, you're going to create a division. You're going to create a rift. If that's all you do is be critical, your kids don't want to be around you. You keep correcting your dog all the time. He's going to look at you like, mm -hmm. Yeah, just recently a dog came into our garage. My wife said, 
Oh, here's a dog, and I hear somebody whistling. The neighbor came to get it, and the dog saw that neighbor and did not want to be with him. And first thought is, why is he running from the master? I know when my dogs see me, they're like, oh, you're the one who feeds us. Oh, oh, it's you. It's you. Listen, that excites me because now I go home. When I was, when I was, listen, my kids were small. I was, it was an exciting time, man. I'd come home. Daddy's home. Everybody applauded. It was an exciting time. I was a hero, man. It was great. Now I go home. The dogs greet me. Where's everybody? Hello? I'm home. The dog's like, <laughs> okay, you like me. All right. Enjoy that time in your life. The terrible twos is wonderful. Enjoy that. <laughs> it's a big Christmas time, I'll tell you this. I remember telling my kids, when you get a gift, don't tell them you don't like it, okay? All right, Daddy. Okay. Somebody gave them some coloring books. They were chinky coloring books. They didn't look good at all. I'm just being honest with you. They looked at it and said, we don't like it. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. Apologize for them. The next year, same couple, same people, and same chinky coloring books. To get the gift, I told them, don't say you don't like it. They open it up again. He said, we don't like it. They take after their mother. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. It's just something in their mom. Sorry. <laughs> just, I gave up on that. Just, just tell them the truth, you know. This stuff's trash, man. Where'd you get this? <laughs> Revelations 2, 2. Says, I know your industry and activities. Look at this. Laborous toil and trouble and your patient endurance, okay, and how you cannot tolerate wicked men and have tested and critically appraised those who call themselves apostles. So he's saying, look, you're doing great with this, okay? Special messages of Christ and yet are not and have found them to be imposters and liars. So they tested everyone. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? You know, the, it's been an old saying that the foolish trust in the wise test. Even Joseph tested his brothers. Do you know that? I often read, the, read, read about the story of Joseph when his brothers had came bowed down to him. I would have thought that Joseph would have took off his wig and said, Hey, guys, it's me. Look, look, the dreams I had. He didn't do that. He tested them. He said, you're spies. And he threw them in jail. And he put them through all kinds of tests to see if they had changed. Right? So we, we test. And that's what they were doing. They tested. Now, I want to show you this, that they must have took Paul's words to heart. Because in the book of Acts, to the elders of Ephesus, what happened was Paul was in Ephesus and he traveled to Miletus, which is another port about 20 miles away. And he called the elders of the church at Ephesus to come and visit him. And this was his parting words to him in Acts 20, 28. He said, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the, which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Wow, that's what he said. Also to your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things who draw away disciples. Now I have to say this. Everything that's spoken, and I'm, I'm going to say this too, and I'll share this on Wednesday. I preach the word of God to you. I may have an experience, but I'm going to preach the word of God to you. You know why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not by experience. Experience should just back up the word, right? Or if it's not in the word, you just toss it out. Well, you know. So here's the thing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This is what he was telling them here to, to preach the word. For your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things and draw away disciples after them. Listen, if somebody tells you um, somebody's got some kind of weird thing and nobody else knows, this is a private revelation. The Bible doesn't say that. It says there's no private revelation like that, right? The spirit of the prophets are known by the prophets, the Bible says. It says, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is what he said, okay? So Jesus commands them, uh, commands them again for not quitting or fainting. So he says, look guys, you didn't quit. You didn't throw in a towel. That's awesome. You kept going. So I know you were enduring patiently and you're not bearing up and, and you are bearing up for my name's sake and you have not fainted or become exhausted or grown weary. Now the Bible says those that hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up. They'll soar with eagle's wings. You'll walk and you'll not faint. So that's encouraging. That's all good stuff. But let's see what he says about them. There was one main thing that they had that was wrong he said this but I have this one charge to make against you this is a big deal that you have left and abandoned the love that you had at first you deserted me your first love now here's an amazing thing these people weren't in the world they want smoking they want token they want drinking they want partying they were going to church they were paying tithes they were a missionary church they were going out and preaching the gospel but yet they had great doctrine but poor devotion 
You know, you can have great doctrine but poor devotion. You can have just perfect doctrine but poor devotion. No devotion to Christ. Your doctrine should lead you to devotion to Christ. That you spend time with the Lord. That you're in love with God. Listen, zeal without knowledge is not good. When I got saved, I had a lot of zeal but not much knowledge. Now I've got zeal with knowledge. It should be a mature love. You should love Jesus more, not less. Now how would my wife feel if, if, if I said, you know, baby, I, when I first met you, I really loved you. But now, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Listen, after all these years, my, gr- my love has grown. It has grown. It is, I still, I'm still on fire. I still love her. Amen? I love her more than I loved her then. It grew. And that's how you love what Christ should be. You should love more, not less. When you see somebody dating, I always know a couple that's dating. When I ride behind them, I see like one head in the car. And every so often I see two heads. Then I see one head again. And I see two heads. Yeah. <laughs> I love you, Brother Tommy, because my wife told me the other day, can I, can I say this? I thought this was the funniest thing. He said, he said, I'm going rubber feet seven days a week. I wanted to say, shut that man up. I'm in trouble, man. My God. No, that was a blessing. You love her. Amen? Yeah, we need to stay on fire for Christ like that in relationship. You know, a married couple, you see them like this. You put a car, drive the car right between them. No, it doesn't need to be like that. It's supposed to be in intimacy. You stay close. You got to work at that relationship. And it's an investment of time. Well, the same is true with Christ. We have to invest our time with him. You can get busy. I know, I know couples, their whole life revolves around the kids. They go, you go into one park, to another park, to another park, another place, and everything's about stuff and things and activities, but never no time together. Well, we do that with God. We're busy working. We're busy cutting the grass. We're busy doing stuff and things that we've got to do in life, but we don't take five minutes. We don't take a half hour to spend time with Christ. We, we were so busy. And before you know it, we don't have the same zeal and the same love that we had at one time and that's exactly what happened to the church at Ephesus there weren't any sin like you would think sin would be they just the sin was their love had grown cold they abandoned their first love it's a picture of a, a man and a woman in two beds they're married but no intimacy now here's the key how many Christians are married to Christ but have no intimacy with him in other words you're a Christian all right you you love the Lord or you say you love the Lord but you have no intimacy with him you have no time with him you know, you're not going to have any babies unless you, unless you have intimacy. And here's the thing, you're not going to birth anything in the kingdom unless you have intimacy with God. And God has called you to intimacy with Him. You've got to spend time with Him, to be with Him. You can be in, in the marriage, so to speak, but not have the intimacy. It says here in Matthew 24 and 12, one of the signs of the end times was this. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Wax cold is where we get the word chilling. A lot of times I call somebody, I say, what you doing? I'm just chilling. I say, I hope not. I hope you're not just chilling. Because a lot of Christians are just chilling. They're getting cold to the things of God. Man, we're supposed to heat it up, man. Get on fire. There's one acceptable temperature. That's hot for God. Amen? Now, it's also amazing. I'm going to close pretty quick. This is about 12. I'm going to have to finish this next week. It was also amazing. So the Ephesians chapter 5 speaks of a marriage and a love as a picture of the church. And I want to read this to you. So Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This is an admonition to every husband. To work on that marriage, love your wife. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. Amen. So you, as a husband, you love your wife, you're loving your own self. Now, here's a scripture I want to get to you. For no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined into his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Look at this. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church Christ and the church that love that love he's coming back for the bride we're the bride of Christ what's the bride going to be doing at the discotheque you know where's the bride going to be yeah what's going yeah what's the bride going to be doing I guess I dated myself to the 80s right I, I just it's been a long time man I've been I've been living for God for a while I, oh yeah I used to do all that you know we thought we were cool yeah thought that was cool back then Remember when the ladies used to have the poof hairdo too? You poofed your hair in the front? My daughter asked me to fix her hair one time, so I poofed her hair. I thought it was cool, you know. 80s. Or oh, it was the bell bottoms of the 70s. Remember, we thought that was cool. Yeah. 
Or how about the socks? Remember the socks used to be that high? You guys used to wear socks up to here and you, you wear little spandex shorts. We thought that was cool too. You look at the old pictures. Yeah, that, that, was, that was me. That was me. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, you heard me say this many, many times before, but one of the things which it, it's, it still amazes me, it just, I, I, can't, I can't get over it, I can't do it. I have jeans that are in style now because they look like trash. <laughs> they got holes all over them, and it's stylish now to look like you're broke as the day is long and wear ripped jeans. I can't bring myself to do it. Because growing up, man, all the other people had all the nice jeans, and Mama used to put patches on my jeans, and I was ashamed of my stylish jeans back then. I was just ahead of my time. That's all it was. <laughs> other people would have said we were poor, but I was just ahead of my time. That's what it was. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't get over that. I'm going to read this last scripture here for you, and then I'm going to close this 12 o'clock. Some of y'all are thinking, the game's on. Listen, remember this. When you're sick, Peyton's not coming. Peyton's not coming. Jesus is going to be there. The church is going to be there for you. I'm almost done. This is it right here. So this is our first love of espousal. Amen. And it's passionate zeal that's motivated by love. Zeal is nothing more than love ablaze. You might just know John 3.16. That's all I knew when I got saved, but it was love ablaze, man. Let me tell you about somebody who died for me. Let me tell you about my Savior who paid a price for me. It was just love ablaze. Jeremiah 2 and 2 says this, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I earnestly remember the kindness of the devotion of your youth. Now, it's interesting here. He didn't say the doctrine of your youth. Now, we need pure doctrine. Don't get me wrong, but it's a devotion. Doctrine that leads to pure devotion. The devotion of your youth. They had a fire for him. They loved God. Your love after your betrothal. Oh, that's a big one. I don't know if you know, but you're betrothed unto God. You're already married unto God. Did you know that? See, you just haven't consummated the marriage yet. In the, Hebrew, in the Hebrew, remember Joseph would come in in the Christmas season. He was betrothed unto Mary to be married. That is a legal document in Judaism. In other words, that was his wife, but they hadn't come together yet. The consummation doesn't come until you have the ceremony. And if you will, you're married to Christ right now, but the consummation doesn't come until Jesus returns and there's a wedding feast. Glory to God. There's a wedding day. But you're already married to him right now. That's why the Bible calls many in, in the book of James. It says, you adulteresses and adulterers fornicating with the world. That's what it says. Go read that. He said this, your devotion of your youth, your love after your betrothal in Egypt and the marriage at Sinai, when God gave the law at Sinai, it was called the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, and that was a marriage. They were married to Christ then. We, if you will, Pentecost, we've been married to God through the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's written his laws upon our hearts, spiritually. You know, we're called bride adorn, right? My job is to get you ready. Get you ready for the, for the wedding feast, because he's coming back. Yeah. I want to be there. I want to be there and watch you as you walk in and say, they went to my church. Yeah, they went to my church. My church. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. My church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see you get all your blessings and all your rewards too. Cool, I'm just be so excited for you. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I'll be crazy there too. Just, just wait. Israel was holiness, something set apart from the ordinary purposes. You've been set apart from the ordinary because God's going to bring you to the extraordinary. It's the truth. You're going from ordinary to extraordinary. Oh, yeah. Dedicated to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest, of which no stranger was allowed to partake. All who ate it, injuring Israel, offended and became guilty. Evil came upon them, says the Lord. In other words, anyone who hurt Israel, man, they got in trouble. Anyone who touches you gets in trouble. Yeah. I'm going to stop there. I'll pick up on this next week. Because uh, there's so much more I want to share with you about your first love. Let's pray right now, guys. First, I want to... First, I want to talk to Christians that have been serving the Lord for any period of time. Has your devotion gone cold? Are you cold in your devotion? Are you still got the same fire? Are you excited about God? Do you love Him as at first? Or are you cold? Are you just cold? Listen, if you're cold, you come to God. God already knows. Ask Him right now to ignite a fire within you. Ask Him right now to make you hungry and thirsty once again. But there's a part you have to play. You have to commit some time to God. To begin to pray in the secret place and seek Him once again. It'll become your favorite place in the world as you seek Him in the secret place. As you dwell in His presence, His presence will permeate your being. And there'll be a fire that God's going to breathe on that dimly lit smoking flax. He's going to breathe on it and the fire's going to burn bright again. And you're going to light up your neighbors, your friends, at school, at work. You're going to be a light to everybody once again. Maybe your light got put out through a fence or, or you got hurt. But listen, God wants to heal you and breathe in you once again. No condemnation. God wants to bring you 
into him again and light you up again so you can be a light to other people. Ask God right now if, if you've been cold in your heart to forgive you, to ignite you once again. Father, I pray for everyone here today that the fire of God would burn bright in their hearts once again, Lord God. They would be on fire for you as Jeremiah, fire shut up in their bones. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to ask you, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the greatest miracle. Jesus healed multitudes of people. He raised the dead. He did many, many miracles, but they all died again. They all died again. So what is the greatest miracle is to receive eternal life. It's to receive eternal life. You can come to church and hear the same message over and over again, and maybe it just goes through one ear and out the other. But the Bible says if you confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. This is the greatest miracle. Pray with me now. Jesus, I confess you as the Lord of my life. Come into my heart. I believe that you died, you were buried, and you rose again the third day. And I commit my life to you. And I thank you, according to Romans 10, that I'm saved in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. There's one more thing I want to do. I'm going to ask my prayer team to come up here before I close this service out today. I want this prayer team up here right now. Come on up here. Now, prayer team, if that's you, you need your, you need your uh, love rekindled, just put your hand on yourself and say, in the name of Jesus, glory to God. Amen. I pray for myself many times. Guys, if you need prayer, they're up here to pray for you, to speak into your life, to lay hands on you. Amen. So I want you to stand with me right now. I want to pray a blessing on your life and ask God's, invoke God's blessing upon you to decree that blessing. But if you want prayer, you'll be able to come forward right after that. Just raise your hands, receive this, Father. In Jesus' name, I'll break every negative thing off of your people. Every attack of the enemy, we rebuke it in Jesus' name. I rebuke all sickness and disease. Father, we just rebuke every discouragement that the enemy has tried to put upon your people. And Father, we bless them this day. And I decree favor. I decree prosperity. I decree blessing, healing, health. Lord God, but most of all, Father, I pray that they come into an intimate relationship with you through the power of the Holy Spirit. That Christ will be revealed in their heart that they might know you, love you, and serve you all the days of their life with passionate zeal and fire, Lord God. This is what I pray for them, Lord. God, I ask this in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would send them out in the zeal of the Lord to preach your gospel in the schools, Lord God, at work, wherever they go, Lord God. Let us be the difference in this nation, Lord God, through the fire that burns in us. God, I pray this for your people. We bless them. Father God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.